um, the, the are heading to court. They are claiming uh, that there is membership manipulation. I think we have some audio, so let's listen in. Um, the court has no objection to that, provided that the um, usual uh, protocols in relation to COVID-19 are adhered to. Um, but I, I take it there's no objection from the parties to that. There's, there's no objection to, to the broadcasting. However, as far as the COVID relations or other regulations are concerned, I'm not sure if uh, this voucher is not uh, this is what actually safe for the presence of the local government because I see that people are still people on each other. Maybe, maybe it can be, I, can, I think the presence may be regulated just for, just for compliance purposes. Yes. yes. Um, I, um, I believe that we are at roughly 50% of capacity just from, from looking at the gallery. Um, so it, it, it looks satisfactory from, from where I sit. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just establish from, from the respondents, what, what is the respondents for you? No objection. Yes, thank you Mr. Scorty, when, when you're ready. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, let, me, let me begin by firstly characterizing what the application is all about. The application is about, the, I mean, the application already is about the interdict, interdicting the branches under the WWDC person from participating in the provincial conference. Perhaps before I address this worship in the matter, let me firstly characterize this. What I understand that there was no compliance, as I informed his watch in chambers, that there was no compliance with his watch uh, directives, and as far as service is services concerned. And I must also characterize that my learned friends, the opponents, were not given time to proffer their response on the application due to non compliance with the, his watch uh, directives. And the second of that, his watch would also notice that the papers were drafted in a haste uh, to the extent that. The paper doesn't, I mean, the paper does not specifically refer to the annexures, although the annexures are closed, which I would submit that in the end they will form an important component of the papers. I mean, the important component of the affidavit. Then, that without this point. Just, thing, just uh, one moment. In, in that regard, the, the annexures that I have are um, various letters from the the African National Congress. That's correct. Uh, Which is an extra one. Yes. It's a letter, yes, it's a letter written by Kulemani. Yes. Maybe let me show you what you can write I have that one. That's dated yes. the 8th and of April. Yes, and an extra two is a letter directed to Mr. Nkaitoli, which is written by Mr. Paul Mashatile, the Church Treasurer General. Yes, 6th of April. And the I indicates that you know, what the search doesn't have, but it's in many lives on a program and starting to take that it was supposed to have found its way and made um, part of those papers is the court order by the Justice in China. Yes. Yes. And in any event, it is a court order. Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, that's that's um, Annex Chapter 3. Yes. The, the document that appears after Annexure 2 in my, my papers is a, a letter from Thelwani attorneys. In, in fact, just to correct, that is supposed to be Annexure 3. And then followed by that is the court order by Hen Justice in Jalil, which is the court order of the 3rd of May. The Se okay, 7th of April. The court order that I, that I spoke in. The first relates to the 7th of April. And that's Annexure 4. That's Annexure 4, yes. And the last being Annexure 5, which is the order by the late Justice Fletcher, I'm told, which was granted just this week on Tuesday. Yes. Yes. That's, that's not part of my papers. And that, I think I, in, in, that, in that case, in that case, I may request a short agenda to make sure that it's not just as many people are going to uh, no, I'm 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 uh, I'm aware of it. I'm aware of it. I think yes, there's no I'm need sure, for from the German. That, that, that court order of the third of May postponed the matter to the thirty first, extending the rule I saw. Yes. Yes. Um. Fine. Yes, and that will be characterised as an extra five from the court.
Can I just uh, confirm with you then that the the applicants were unable to comply with the directives that's given correct. earlier? That's correct. That's correct. And, and, and I wish I would have, I would have loved that my instructing attorney deposed onto the affidavit to explain that. But now you yes. are supposed to have happened. Yes. But in but that case, maybe it's not being irregular. I mean, of course, the attorney to take the witness then maybe to give out a background rather an explanation as to why his motion to order was not complied with, which I, which I believe is somewhat very important. Yes, for but I, I, I think, can, can we accept that the the papers were not served in accordance with that order? That's correct. Sorry, with, with those directives? Yes, that's correct. Uh, I also understand that the papers were delivered to the respondents. That's correct. And, um, at, at best, two hours ago. That's correct. And I, I, if I remember, if I'm going to confirm with my learned friend, the respondent is not taking issue with the receipt of papers. Yes. yes. Maybe, maybe, maybe my, my learned friend may confirm with that because the five-page affidavit, the much reliance is placed on the previous application, which I believe both my learned friends have appeared in that matter, yes. which is the main application because this, this is, this is an interlocutory application. But before, may I request that my learned friend confirm? Uh, no, not okay. stage. I'm Maybe not going to, to hear the life of the respondents in due course. Um, but certainly as, as the matter stands at the moment, this has been a, a very hastily construed application. That's correct, not. Um, I hesitate to use the word chaotic, but certainly that's the word that comes to mind. <laughs> Yes, and indeed. In, in actual fact, in actual fact, I think safely you may use the word chaotic indeed. Yes. Yes, all right. Um, I think that uh, I'd, I'd like to hear you first on, on the question of urgency. Yes, ma'am. Um, first and foremost, in my mind, is the question of whether this is not self created urgency. <coughs> so, um, perhaps yes. You can me on that. Yes. Well, just to give a background, for starters, this is fine indeed. This is a matter that emanates from the 3rd of April, from the 7th of April. We're in, we're in an order by your sister, Justice Mjali, was issued directing the respondents to afford their respective branches an opportunity of being heard and as well interdicting the regional conference in the Dr. W. B. Hobusana region. Now, following from that, my lord, supposed, or there were supposed to have been internal processes that are performed by the structure, the regional structure, I mean the, the provincial structure. Thereafter, what was, what was going to inform the finality of the matter is that all respective branches be given a right of hearing and therefore all matters be redressed. But what is crucial about, in the main application, what is crucial was there appears to have been a manipulation of the processes in as far as the respective branches are concerned. Then upon the manipulation, as well as the irregularities that existed, and to that, to that effect, my lord, I would refer his lordship to paragraph, or rather to annex chapter one, wherein the ANC, which is the National Structure, admits, or in fact annex chapter two, and may I take his lordship to paragraph to the second paragraph of the correspondence? Yes, which reads the key issues that required investigations were allegations of membership manipulation in some branches. The same allegations were raised in the meeting between the national or the national officials and provincial officials. Now this been raised. The reports allege that the regional membership officer in the Dr. W. Hosanna is manipulating the membership system by enlisting new members, ex existing members in the ANC database. The province further alleged that there are two staff members at the ANC National Call Center aiding the manipulation of the system in some regions, uploading members without knowledge of the leadership of the branches and region. The details of the allegation and the words affected are contained in the report from the province. Now, Manoli, this is clearly something that has been admitted by the ANC upper structure that indeed there are irregularities. And in our main application, we characterize 
the audit reports which we say included people who were dead or people who were non-existent, some of which a lot were in prison. Now, those were the irregularities that led to the initial process. Now, what needed to happen following that was that all those issues be resolved. Now, as we stand by... Okay, sorry, can I interrupt you there? Thank you. I, I don't know that this letter can be read so far as to admitting irregularities. Certainly, it acknowledges that there are oh, yes, yes. of yes. irregularities. For lack of a better word, Manot, but in, indeed, it acknowledges that they are. And subsequent to that acknowledgement, it therefore means that there must be investigation done. Which investigation were yet to hear of the report of it? Now, my Lord, those branches were complaining of the very same irregularities that is contained in the, main, in the main application. We are yet, or rather the applicants are yet to hear of the outcome of those regulations. And in any event, even if, even if there was an outcome, even if there was an outcome, supposedly, the respective branches that rerun all the branch, all, all the all, all the BGMs, and they have to be eligible to go to the regional conference. Then subsequent the RDC, they, then they participate in the in the provincial conference. That is that is where the crux of the matter is, and we submit for that reason, my lord, my lord, when the matter was postponed on Tuesday, when the matter was postponed on Tuesday by agreement between the parties, what we understood was that now Tuesday being this week. And this is glaring from the facts which I believe are not going to be denied. When the matter was postponed on Tuesday, the respondent was yet to comply with the, with the initial order by filing papers. Perhaps in the papers, what we expected to hear was that we have resolved the situation and the, the redress has been afforded. Therefore, go and participate, or rather, go and rerun all the, all, all the BGMs. But, as far as that application stands, or the order postponing the matter, what we understand is that that issue has not been resolved. Now, it cannot be, it cannot be that on Tuesday a respondent or a respondent postpones the matter to a certain date and allows the very same respective branches that are, that have irregularities to participate. And that is exactly why, as the applicants to say, those respective branches or other. The Dr. W. B. Hubusa and I mean, uh, uh, region mustn't participate owing to the compliance of the order of Justice, uh, Madam Justice Njali. Now, the agency, the agency which I which I seek to address his lordship on is that it's clearing from those facts. Unfortunately, unfortunately, my lord, if the matter was postponed on Tuesday, with the hope that with the hope that the applicants are yet to be redressed, then on comes Friday or come Saturday, then the applicants are, are told that the very same region, the say, very same region that has irregularities is participating in the conference. And that would actually take me where, my Lord, take me to this point, which I believe may be a misconception in the end of this case. The applicant is not interdicting the provincial conference. Let me make that clear. The applicant is simply interdicting the very same, the very same Dr. W. B. Khubusana, which has irregularities. It's nothing to do. The conference can continue. That we don't have, have a problem with. So All what we are saying is... Say that, yes. That? Yes, my lord? Just repeat that. You, you, what, what does the applicant say? Yes, the applicant doesn't say the conference must stop. The applicant simply says, on the face of the existing irregularities, or rather, on the pending matter that is yet to be finalized, these respective branches cannot... These respective... I mean, this, this region cannot participate on those reasons. And that is glaring from the from the from the judgment of a ladyship, uh, Madam Justice Bzinjali. Until such is resolved, then the branch, I mean, the region cannot participate. And that is simply what we're here for as the applicants. So, yes, if, if I can just uh, clarify this, then the, the applicants are not seeking to interdict the the holding no. of the provincial conference. That's not what we are saying. Hence, hence what I wanted to clear that misconception. The idea, the general idea is that we are here to stop the provincial conference. No, we're not here to stop the provincial conference. The, well and good, the provincial conference can, can continue. But what we are saying is, owing to the order of Justice Njali and the irregularities which were glaring from the main application that are yet to be addressed, then the region cannot participate.
uh, yes, well, step back or two. You, you're saying that the, the applicants seek to prevent the, the delegates from the BGMs and BDGMs That's correct. The from participating, so from participating. In, in the provincial yes. conference. Owing to the irregularities, my lord, in the main application that are yet to be resolved. Because we haven't had a report that says that was those were resolved. And yes, and the audit right. reports, yes, and the yes. audit and the audit reports that are contained in the main application, <coughs> including including dead people and including people who are in prison. We haven't had a report to that effect that no, we have we have we have removed those people from the list. That audit report still exists and is being used for the registration of the regional of the of the, of the WB Hosanna region. Yes. So simply just, just hold on, just hold on. Thank you. Um, is, is the relief that you're seeking, it's actually not quite apparent from the papers, precisely what relief you are seeking? Yes, uh, but the, the relief, yes, well, as indeed it's not apparent. Like, I, like as I indicated to his lordship, unfortunately the papers, yes, the papers were not pre were prepared in a haste. But it, what we seek is getting on the notice of... Can, can I just again clarify with you, are, are you then seeking to extend the the reach, as it were, of, of my system Dali's order uh, to include the prevention of the delegates from participating in the provincial conference. If, if you look at if you yes, look yeah, the, yes. the order that was previously given, the rule lies I um, simply called upon the respondents to show cause why the orders, following orders shall be confirmed. Um, Firstly, that the BBGMs and the BGMs held in, in February and March were conducted in an unconstitutional and unlawful manner. Correct, you say yes, my lord. Secondly, that the decisions emanating therefrom are void. That, that is restricted to the rule of the Yes, my lord. And then, paragraph three of the order was the intellect itself. Yes, in paragraph in three of the order was the intellect itself. Correct, uh, preventing the regional conference from proceeding and in terms of the order that um, that incident had immediate effect yes my lord yeah. now, are, are you saying in, in terms of the, the existing application the application that is before the court now yes my lord you're seeking to extend that rule as I to cover participation in of the delegates in the provincial conference. Yes. What uh, I, I understand the language of the of the prayers to be requesting a declaration, but in the alternative, my argument would be that in as far as the region has irregularities, which are emanating from the branches. Now, without without me, my lord, asking for a declarator to be made by his lordship is that in as far as there are irregularities with the with the, the Dr. W. B. Hobosana region, which am which are emanating from their respective branches under that region, then they cannot participate. But a finding hasn't been made in that regard. No finding has been made yet. Yes, no finding has been made yet. Can Hence the court can the court make such a pending investigation of the delegations? Okay. I, I want to I want to ensure that I'm understanding his lordship correctly because I thought when his lordship says a finding hasn't been made on that, I believe his lordship to be saying a finding on the irregularity or the regularity of the respective branches or rather the holding of the conference is concerned hasn't been made. Okay. I, maybe I mistakenly understood his lordship to be speaking of that. Yes, now, well, I, if, if you look if you look at the wording of, of the order issued by Johnny J on the seventh of April, uh, the order simply is to be affected a rule nizai is issued. That's what I can inviting the respondents to show cause why the holding of those meetings should not be declared unlawful. Correct so much. The manner in which those meetings were conducted should not be declared unlawful. That's correct, Lord. Can, can a court now, this court, make the, the order that, that you seek? You, you seek yes. to prevent the delegates from <coughs> participating in that conference? Yes. And, and Notwithstanding the fact that there hasn't been any finding. Yes, my lord. And, and my argument to that will be that 
whilst we are still awaiting a finding on that, whilst, whilst we are still waiting a finding on the irregularity, whether there are irregularities or not, then this respective region cannot participate. I'm not sure if I'm answering this question correctly, but what, what, I is, what I understand is that what the court, what we are requesting the court to do is, whilst you are having troubles with your matters, don't participate in the strike, or don't participate in the in the in the next or forthcoming, um, um, I mean, uh, forthcoming conference, owing to the irregularities that are yet that are yet to be resolved by a finding, whatever whatever the finding may be. But for all we know, the delegates may may be perfectly entitled to attend that conference. And um, they may be entitled only if. They are. They were right, rather, or rather, they come from the appointment of lawful of what, what may be declared as lawful outcomes. At right. stake, we do not we do not know them to be lawful, especially especially on those respective branches that we say the elections were conducted irregularly. Yes. Yes. Look, I, I, I realize. And and see. this is yes. This is this is what my lord. I will say. This is what we have to save for the determination of the matter on the thirty first of May. Yes. Yes. What, what, what we are seeking is what to do is not to is not necessarily to tremble on the order of the justice in China, but we are saying, in as far as you are having troubles, wait right there, right, wait right here. Don't participate in the next process because you are a product of what is suspected to be a fraud. Yeah. Yes. Look, I I, I realize we have now slipped into the merits. Yes, and, and I, I <laughs> take you back. Thank you. To the question of urgency. Yes, ma'am. And before I allow you to, to speak further. Would surely the respondents ought to have anticipated problems well in advance before, before the situation reached this point? In other words, mm -hmm. the order was given by, by Johnny Day on the 7th of April. That's more correct. than a month ago. Yes, correct. Yes, correct. Yes, correct. Month ago. Uh, surely in the, in the lead up to the return date on the 3rd of May, the respondents would have realized, look, we, we're not going to, to get the outcome that we see. We don't know which way the respondents are going to be going in terms of the answering papers. Let us, well in advance of the provincial conference, uh, take what necessary steps we have to. Yes, my Lord, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so because, because responses may be given even a day later. May women would have been given a day later after, after the, the 31st of, I mean, the, the 3rd of May. This, month, this week. So I think it would be premature for the respondent, I mean for the applicants to simply run to court for something they think may because I, I, I believe that they would not have good cause to go, to go simply go to court on anticipation yet without a reasonable fact. My submission to that extent will be that that would be premature of the respondents. At least now we know for a fact that they are participating in the conference. And, and my Lord, I, I believe it is not it was not okay, unreasonable sorry, for the case. Just stop you there again. Thank you. Like, isn't, isn't the 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 follow up question to that then uh, to the effect that by agreeing to the postponement on the third May, the respondents have placed themselves in this position. The respondents of the applicant. Sorry, I think about the applicants have placed themselves in this position. I, 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 even even on that one, I wouldn't say so because postponement of the matter in between in between by agreement can resolve if it can yield even positive results than negative results. So it is not it is not unreasonable for them to anticipate to stay right up until the eleventh hour. And in any event, my Lord, even if even if after the postponement on Thursday even after the postponement on Thursday, or rather they would have they would in fact after the postponement on Thursday any positive results could be yielded to could have been yielded. I, I, I wasn't a part of the proceedings yes. on the third of May, so I, I, I'm a little bit of a disadvantage in knowing what the circumstances were, but it, it, it certainly strikes me as odd where the applicants have their rule and eyes on, the applicants have their internet. On the third of May, the applicants go to court in the absence of the respondents' papers. Yes. Surely, on that date, the applicants would have said to the court, we hear, we seek our final order. 
We are interested in any arguments being put forward by the respondents in this stage. We seek our relief here and now. The provincial conference is in a few days' time. We are here to get our final order. Yes. Instead, the, the applicants, by agreement, as you told me, by agreement, allow the rule to be extended to 31st of May. Maybe in the course, yes. Yes. some sort of explanation. Yes. To answer his Lordship's question, may I, because I do not want to take it, I mean, to argue an incorrect point. May I, may I request from, may I request from my, my, my starting attorney to see the wording, the wording of the, of the court order, because it might be that I'm using the incorrect term by saying by agreement. It could have been, a, it could have been a direction from the judge, I do not know. In fact, I'm told by my starting attorney that postponement was requested by them and they were granted. I'm not sure if it was by them. Yes, I'm, I'm told by my instruction at any that... What was, was that an application for a postponement? It was not, yes. So it was, was the application opposed by the applicants? I don't think it was opposed, no. So the application was not opposed by the It was not opposed, yes. It may, it may have been an agreement, but I just wanted to ensure it may have been an agreement. Yes. 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 Correct. You know, let's see whatever the court rules are there. Yes, and, and, and my lord, and my lord I, even, even if that is so, I do not understand that to be a self-created agency, especially that, because I, I do not know what the terms of the agreement were. But agreeing, agreeing on postponement does not necessarily inform that, that the, 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 the Dr. W. B. Humusana, uh, I mean the region, is going to participate. Because what brings us to court is not necessarily agreeing to postponement. What brings us to court is knowing that this particular region, absent or other, on the face of the glaring irregularity or alleged glaring irregularities, they are still are still continuing to participate. That is that is what we are here for. Indeed, it could have been agreed by the parties, but participation or an agreement does not necessarily mean that. The, I mean, the, I mean, the region is going to participate in the conference. Perhaps, perhaps rather, it could have been sought. Perhaps not. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Perhaps not expressly, but but logically, logically, and and and. Yes, well, logically, yes. can it not be said that the applicants ought to have realized the risk? The applicants ought to have realized the risk of allowing a postponement. The applicants, in, 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 presumably in, in discussing the, the pros and cons of, of, of uh, what the respondents sought on the third of May, would have weighed up their options and said, well, look, uh, this potentially affects our, our, our uh, status and standing in relation to the provincial conference. Can, can we really get this, get this going? Well, in, 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 in the very same breath, my lord, I do not believe that, fine, I do not believe that agreeing to a postponement necessarily or rather brings a thought in the mind that I could have my rights trampled on. Much as much as the respondent could have exercised the very same and say, fine, I find we have a request for a postponement. We are not doing anything as the region until such time we resolve the issue. So it cannot necessarily be faulted on the applicant that agreeing to a postponement you simply waived away your rights. What about the respondent? The very same respondent who has requested, who has requested a postponement to resolve these matters. Now clearly, to one's mind, requesting a postponement to go and fix something I mean, I mean, requesting and a postponement to go and resolve something may, may yield positive results to me as the applicant, or rather, may mean that I am yet to resolve the problems that, are, that I have as the region. Now, one cannot deduce from one request for a postponement positively to resolve a matter that I will be, I will be inconvenienced Yes, my lord. That's my suggestion. I think in the absence of his lordship's question, I, I think I've dealt with it. In fact, I've dealt with both the merits as well as the issue of agency. Okay. Thank you, my lord. I will ask. I will, I will, I will um, wait for sorry, the response. Sorry, just before you sit down. Uh, from the, the founding academy, unless I have missed it, uh, there is no reference to a date for the provincial conference. Well, 
Mm. But Lord, that, that's a matter of an iota that the provincial conference is today. I, 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 do, not, I do not think that my, my, my opponents would actually take issue with that, not being on the paper. It's a, it's a glaring issue. It is today. Everyone is here. Um, yes. With, without, um, without requesting you to submit evidence from the bar, yes, can I just establish when, when the conference started and when is it, is, is it expected to, to be completed? Well, I, I, believe, I believe it may be completed. I think it is, it is meant to start at 8. No? No. I think it is meant to start at 9 today and right through. At, at 9 o'clock, yes. yes. 9 o'clock this evening. This evening, yes. Right through the hours of the night. Well, I think completion, yes, the completion would depend upon the completion of all the activities taking place inside there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, all right. Thank you. Um, the other question I had was the, the second prayer. Ooh. Sorry, not the second prayer. The, the third prayer of the notice of motion simply doesn't make sense. I, I, I neither, presume. Neither, yeah, neither does it to me. And I, I, I believe it's not that much necessary. Yes. Are, are you abandoning the I can, I can safely abandon it. Yes. And 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 costing the event of opposition, and I see that there is opposition. Costs. And that's a, that's a matter that is entirely up to his lordship uh, discretion. So you're not seeking costs. No, we are seeking costs, but I'm I'm simply saying, in addition to that, that's a matter that's entirely up to his lordship discretion. But, but I, I need to address this aspect as well. Still, in relation to, to the question of urgency, uh, you, you know the provisions of Rule 612 um, require a party to demonstrate on the papers why, if I remember off the top of my head, why substantial regress cannot be obtained in due course. Correct, so in, in that moment, that's, that's what it requires. Why? Should this court grant the relief you seek, particularly in relation to urgency, when it will be open to the applicants merely to take any decisions made at this provincial conference on review at the latest stage? Well, what I, what I understand, my lord, about the expression on urgency, as well as the cases, unfortunately, that I do not have at my disposal, is that. Even if one may have a remedy, but a remedy must be substantial. And I do not, I do not understand the explanation of the rule to be saying, let the harm happen because anyway you will deal with it later. The, the participation, my Lord, will inform the appointment of the new ANC chairperson. Now, what happens? What happens in a situation whereby they participate? Unfortunately, they can they cannot go back and redress or rather take their votes back because on the ballot paper we do not know if. From the region, from the Khobusana region, who is voting for who and who is voting for who? Now, clearly, there is no redress. On, I mean, there can never be a question of redress on that. Otherwise, it will cause a pandemonium whereby the whole process, wastage of money, everything has to be started afresh. But you, you will accept that, in the same breath, the risk remains that if these delegates are prevented from participating, they could nevertheless take these very proceedings, the conference proceedings, on review at a later stage. They, they will in, never. In other words, whichever way you look at it, yes, uh, a review is, is possible. But I want you to understand this logic on the second or the second um, explanation. Uh, in, in other words, the, the, the 
what, what I would have thought the better course of action would have been for the applicants was to have said, fine, we exclude it from this conference. However, we have the right to approach court in due course to review the decisions taken at the provincial conference held in the standard on the 7th and 8th of May. That, that, that is their right. However, if, if they are, the, well, the, 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 the opposite side of the is that if, if the, the delegates participate, if the delegates participate, somebody else could say, no, 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 they were never permitted or, or, or never to participate in this, in this conference. We're going to take the decisions of the conference on review. I, I, yes, well, I, I do not understand it to be an issue that the applicant may take um, the provincial conference on review should they not participate, or rather, you know, should they not participate because of, like owing to the order of Justice Mujak. Well, they, they opted they opted to, to follow the to follow the rules. I mean the the, 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 I mean, the lawful processes themselves. Now. On review, they, what would they be reviewing on a on a on a conference that took that took place lawfully? Because them not participating owing to, an, to a lawful to a lawful order does not necessarily make the provincial conference, which is failing to participate, it does not nullify to make it irregular. So I think I I would say, Malone, in that case, them not participating will be on their own willingness, not not a matter that forms that, that makes the, the the conference to be irregular or unlawful. Yes. 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 All right. Fine. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. No, nothing else. Thank you. Mr. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. make reference to what I refer to as the old papers. My colleague prefers to refer to those papers as the main application. We don't. No. Just, sorry, just, to put on, just before you carry on further, um, I think perhaps under the, the rubric of housekeeping, you will accept that I can only hear legal arguments. Of course. In the absence of any Davis. Certainly. Evidence. Certainly, my lord. And, and the first is the evidence from the bar that was turned up by my colleague. It is simple, unacceptable. And it's worse in circumstances where the respondents have been ambushed by litigation in the manner that was explained earlier by my colleague. That respondents received papers only when they were in court and therefore were not afforded an opportunity to prepare answering papers. In those circumstances, it is simple, clearly, extremely unacceptable for a party to tender evidence from the bar. And that evidence is, when is the provincial conference? There is nothing in the papers that tell your lordship when is the provincial conference. And that is related to the question of agency because you've got to pin your agency to a particular occasion. So we would urge your lordship not to consider the evidence that was tendered by our colleague from the bar relative to when is the provincial conference. There is no reason whatsoever why that piece of evidence is not in the founding of David. Nothing whatsoever. The next issue is the question of annexures. You were told that there are about five annexures to the founding of David. You will search, we submit, my lord, in vain on the papers looking for passages where reference is made to these annexures.
If you go to paragraph 1 to 3 of the founding affidavit, the applicant tells your lordship who he is, and then he tells your lordship about the background to the matter. Then if you turn the page, you'll find paragraphs 4 to 8. You will not find on that page reference to a specific annexure. If you turn the page, paragraph 9.2 to 10.2, nothing whatsoever is said about a specific annexure to the papers. If you turn the page, you find the last page of the affidavit. It says nothing about annexures. So what is it that you have? What you have is a deponent who has prepared an affidavit and placed evidence before court and chose not to make reference to any annexures. So that what you now have is our colleagues simply placing what they refer to as annexures to the affidavit, annexures one to annexure number five. It simply doesn't work that way, my lord, with respect. The deponent who prosecutes the case in court has chosen not to make reference to annexures. It is not available to our colleagues to tell your lordship that while well, you have so many annexures, in circumstances where the deponent has chosen to say nothing about them. I accept that in, in matters of this nature where, where they've been drafted very hastily, um, the, the precise uh, wording and text that one would want to see doesn't always appear. I accept that, my lord. I, I think this is taking it to an extreme. It, it, it is, my lord, certainly. It is taking it to, the, to an extreme. And even in those circumstances where letters such as this one would be relied upon by deponent, they being here say to him, you then have to tell your lordship why he believes in the cogency of that hearsay evidence and why your lordship should accept it. Why is it that the person on, whose, on whom the property value of that evidence depends isn't the one who puts an affidavit before court? This hasn't been done. There is no explanation for it. So we, we, I agree with your lordship. It is taking it to the extreme. So we would urge your lordship not to consider that material because it is simply improperly before court. And the law, insofar as annexures are concerned, is clear in the decision in Swissboro, and the Supreme Court of Appeal reiterated that decision in the matter of NDPP versus Zuma, 2009, volume 2, SA 277 in brackets SCA, and the relevant paragraph is paragraph number 47. Mr. Justice Haram's DP, as it then was, says, it is simply unexpected and undesirable of a party to expect their opponent to simply troll through annexures, trying to find out what case is being made by reliance to the annexures. Now, this is indeed in the extreme, because in those cases, you would have at least reference to a particular annexure. Here, there is not even that. Then the next issue, my lord, is the postponement before Miss Justice Pesce on Tuesday of what is referred to as the main application. Your lordship is aware about the practice of this court. On Tuesdays, what is convened is the unopposed court. It doesn't deal with and determine opposed applications. What happened is the matter came on the, seven, on the 5th of April as an urgent application. A determination on the question of agency in the rule East and the rule NISA was made on the 7th of April. Then the matter was postponed to the unopposed court. This issue, that again, which is evidence from the bar, that the, the respondents in that application applied for the postponement of the matter, is, it simply doesn't hold any water because it was a Tuesday in the unopposed court, the matter is opposed. The proper procedure is that the applicants who seek to have their matter determined finally, in circumstances where it is opposed, must apply to the registrar of the court for a date in the opposed court. We didn't hear our colleagues make a suggestion that a date had been applied from the registrar for the determination of that case as an opposed matter, and that the date that was given was in fact Tuesday. I would submit that the registrar would not have given them a Tuesday because opposed applications are had on a Thursday. Uh, sorry, can I just uh, <coughs> find that with you? Are you then saying that the, the 
respondents did not apply for a postponement. They, they, they didn't, but the matter was postponed as it would have been, and the rule NISA extended because until to the opposed rule. indeed until the matter until somebody applies for a date in the opposed court and they are allocated that date. Then the procedure is that it is then postponed to the opposed court with the rule NISA extended, as it were. They are answering our papers, but not. The matter is opposed. They are answering papers. And, and that is done by the 3rd of May? By the, yes, by the 3rd of May. My Lord, when the matter came before Ms. Justice Mjali, the respondent filed opposing papers. Uh, can you, I don't have that, that file in front of me. What is the date in which those answering papers are filed? I believe, my Lord, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm making this submission under serious correction that the opposing papers were filed on the date of hearing, which would have been the 5th of April. Yes, 5th of April. My colleague, Ms. Mashia, confirms that she was party to the case as much as I was. I think the hearing was on the 7th of April. No, my Lord, with respect, the hearing was on the 5th. The, the Ms. Justice Mjali postponed the matter for her to deliver an order on the 7th of April. So by, by the 5th of April, the farming papers and the answering papers were before court? Indeed. Okay. And then, my lord, the I would say at this stage so much for what I refer to as housekeeping issues. I'll now endeavor to show the court why your lordship should not come to the aid of the applicants. And in so doing, first I said I'll deal with the question of agency, and then secondly, I'll deal with the nature of the order that's being sought, and thirdly, I'll make reference to what is referred to as the main application. We submit that the matter is not urgent. And in fact, the applicant, the applicant, not applicants, and I'll return to that, the applicant is with us on this call. Nowhere in the founding of a David does the applicant tell your lordship, why is this application urgent? We accept that there is a certificate of urgency that was placed before a lordship, but we say that certificate of agency does not absolve the applicant from doing what the applicant should do. There is a decision, I've made it available to our colleagues electronically. I asked your, your Lordship's clerk to print for your Lordship. It's a decision in big blue marketing CC versus King Sabata Dalindiabo local municipality. It's a judgment by Mr. Justice Brooks. Paragraph number three reads, <coughs> it is necessary for an applicant to set out fully in the certificate of agency the grounds upon which he or she relies in approaching the court pursuant to the provisions of Rule 612 of the Uniform Rules of Court. It is equally necessary for an applicant to set out fully in the founding affidavit the circumstances which render the matter urgent and the reasons why he or she claims that substantial relief cannot be obtained at a hearing in due course. We searched from the founding affidavit in vain for grounds advanced by the applicants to suggest that the matter is urgent. And indeed, not one ground could be found. The reason is not far to find. They don't know when is the provincial conference. If they knew, that would have been stated in the founding affidavit. It's not there. It goes to the heart of the question of urgency. Why should your Lordship, on a Saturday evening, be in court? Why should our colleagues, on a Saturday evening, not be with their families, but be in court? Why will the applicant not obtain substantial redress at a hearing in due course? When is the provincial conference? They don't know it. The deponent simply knows nothing about it. If he knew, 
he would have told you Lord Sip when it is. So that it has not been established why is the matter so extremely urgent that the court must sit on a weekend. Recently, and I believe this must have been May I, may I take your lordship to paragraph 6 of that same judgment? Mr. Justice Brooks says, Paragraph 3 and 4 of the Certificate of Agency quoted above, and I submit, my lord, who have not been given even that Certificate of Agency, offer a series of legal arguments and conclusions which are, not, which are not repeated in the founding affidavit. Now, if your lordship is in possession of the certificate of agents and it tells him why the legal representatives of the applicant believe that the matter is, is, is urgent, we submit that as in the matter that was entertained by Mr. Justice Brooks, in this matter, whatever is suggested as reasons and grounds for agency in the certificate of agency did not find its way into the founding affidavit. And no one bothers to explain to the court why. He then says, nor does the founding affidavit contain sufficient factual allegations about the tender process to enable the court to determine the correctness or otherwise of the arguments and conclusions which appear to have been offered in the certificate of agency. My Lord, you are in the same frame here. Then, in paragraph 8, The learned justice says, moreover, where an applicant fails to place sufficient and explicit reasons before the court in the founding affidavit, upon which reliance is to be placed in an attempt to secure an order in terms of Rule 612 of the Uniform Rules of Court, he or she runs the risk of a dismissal of the application on the basis that it lacks the requisite element or degree of urgency. This is the horse that the applicant chose to ride. It has taken him to where he wanted it to take him, his destination. That the application should be struck from the roll on account of absence of agency, because he has made no case whatsoever in the papers in support of it. Now, recently, the High Court in Grahamstown, in the matter between the MEC for Education and the Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm told it's the, it's the, it's the Bishop High Court, my lord. In the matter of Mbude versus the MEC for education, the matter was heard, I'll find out for your lordship, on 26th April 2022, and your brother, Mr. Justice Govinji, delivered a judgment on the 3rd of May 2022. It deals with the question of agency in paragraph 8 of that judgment. And then in paragraph 9 he says this, the applicant is expected in the founding affidavit to set forth explicitly the circumstances which is averred, render the matter urgent, and the reasons why the applicant claims that substantial regress could not be afforded at a hearing in due course. Put differently, if the matter were to follow its normal courses laid down by the rules, would the applicant be afforded substantial redress? If not, the matter qualifies to be enrolled and heard as an urgent application. If so, the application does not pass the test for agency. The question as to the absence of substantial redress in an application brought on usual time frames lies at the heart of the question of agency. Now the question is, we ask rhetorically, where does the applicant address this issue in the papers? Nowhere. And we say, my lord, he cannot rely on the papers that served before court on the 5th of April in what our colleagues refer to as the main application. And the reason is this. Ms. Justin Mjali determined on the basis of the papers that were before he, her, on the basis of the evidence that was before her, that the issues that served before her on the 5th of, uh, of April were urgent. <coughs> this has nothing to do with what is happening today. A case for agency about what is serving before lordship today has to be made in the papers. It hasn't been made. So that we submit that your lordship should strike the matter from the roll for want of agency. And 
We would submit that even though the judgments we rely on are judgments by single judgment, judges of this division, they are binding on your lordship. Unless, of course, your lordship finds that those judgments are clearly incorrect. The default position is that they are binding. And then the exception is if your lordship finds that they are clearly incorrect. We submit that they are correct, they are good law, and we urge your lordship to follow them. The next issue is the kind of order that is being sought. We heard from our colleagues that there's a misconception about the case. There is belief that what the applicant seeks to do, and I keep saying the applicant, not applicants, my lord. I will return to that question later. What the applicant seeks to do is not to interdict the provincial conference, but to interdict a, a particular region, the Hubusana region, from participating in the conference. Well, we don't want to take it from our colleague. We prefer to interpret the notice of motion. If my lord goes to paragraph number two and three, your lordship will know what relief it is that's being sought by the applicant this evening. He seeks that the rule is issued by her ladyship, Miss Justice Mjall, on 7 April, insofar as it relates to the status of BGMs and BBGMs in the Dr. W. B. Hoopsana region, is extended to encompass the provincial conference. That's what he seeks. What the affidavit in this case doesn't do is to tell your lordship what case is made in the affidavit that served before Ms. Justice Mjali, what case is made in support of the extension of an interdict to cover a provincial conference? Nothing is said. Nothing is said. So this order is there for the mere taking. The applicant must ask for it and get it. He doesn't, he, he doesn't have to put in the underlying foundation that your lordship would consider and then come to the conclusion that the applicant is entitled to a particular relief. And then he says, at paragraph 3, that the operation of the rule NISA dated 7 April, uh, the participation of the branches of the WP Hubusana region as voting delegates in the conference uh, must be interdicted. I know that there is, there is an order that was abandoned, Malot, I believe it's, it's paragraph... This is very Paragraph three. Then I will not take your lordship's time in so far as that is concerned. But the point is this. What is sought here is a variation. There is an order that is already in existence. It, on specific terms, it is suggested that your lordship should tamper with that order and vary it so that it becomes something else other than that which it currently is. Now, what is the window? What is the door through which the applicants can approach your lordship if they want a variation. It is rule 42, sub rule 1. But the scope is curtailed because the jurisdictional factors in rule 42, sub rule 1 are clear. And our colleagues have said nothing about it. This is a hopeless case. It was hopeless from the beginning. It is still hopeless. We submit that rule 42 says the court may in addition to any other powers it may have, meromotu, or upon application by any party affected. Now we know the applicant says I'm in court, he says I'm affected. Rescind or vary. A, an order or judgment erroneously sought or erroneously granted. They are not making that case. That the order they seek your lordship to vary was sought and granted in error. An order B, an order or judgment in which there is an ambiguity or a patent error or omission, but only to the extent of such ambiguity, error or omission. They are not making that case. They can't make it. They came to court on the 5th of April 2022. They sought a specific order. They got a specific order. It was never sought in error. There is no ambiguity. Even if there is, none is pleaded in the founding of a David. C, an order or judgment granted as the result of a mistake common to the parties. My Lord, the parties I represent together with Ms. Mashia made no mistake, so that even if the applicants made a mistake, 
that mistake is not common. And if it is not common between the parties, your lordship doesn't have jurisdiction to grant the order that they seek. So, so that the, the, the primary submission is that even on the substantive question, the applicants have simply not made a case. I have said, my lord, I keep referring to the applicant in the singular and not in the plural. May I ask your lordship to go to paragraph one of the founding of the I accept that in the process heading it is indicated that your lordship has more than one applicant. But this is important, especially for the question of costs, because we shall seek them. Now, paragraph one says in 1.1, I am the I am currently residing, he gives an address. He then says, I'm the first applicant in these proceedings and have in a due and proper manner been authorized to depose to this affidavit in support of the relief. Needless to state that, my lord, he doesn't have to be authorized to depose to his own affidavit. He simply doesn't require that. He then says, I'm a member in good standing. I depose to this affidavit in my own free will and volition regarding the events that turned out in the facts set out below. But who are the other applicants? They are not in the affidavit, and not one has filed, even though the affidavit com omits them. Not one has said, by way of a confirmatory affidavit, hang on, hang on, even though I'm not inside that bus, but I, 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 I am there by way of a confirmatory affidavit. So the applicant is here on his own. There are not more than one applicants in the matter before your lordship. So we submit, my lord, that your lordship should consider this matter on the basis that there's only one applicant before then, the third issue is, I've said, I'll refer to what my colleague refers to as the, the old papers. And let me lay a foundation for this. It is this. What has been suggested is that, well, what we seek is not the interdict of the provincial conference. What we seek is the interdict of branches from the Hubusana region from participating. May, may I inquire from your lordship whether your lordship has the, the papers in the so-called main application. I do have the papers, but not the first one. All right. My Lord, paragraph 11 of the founding of a David in those papers, not, not in the application yeah. that's before us, reads as follows. In addition, we also bring this application in our capacity as the leaders of the disbanded branch executive committee structures of the ANC. It then lists the branches affected, not the entire region. It lists branches of what 42, 11, 12, 17, 20, 22, 26, 34, and 46, 2, 4, 6, 8, 9. It lists nine branches in the entire region so that the order that is sought that branches, all the branches from the specific region should, be, should not participate in the conference, or that you must extend the operation of the interdict to include the provincial conference, which your lordship up until now doesn't know where it is because the applicant has not told him. That order would not cover the entire region because only specific branches, nine in number, <laughs> were mentioned in the papers that served before Ms. Justice Mjali. Your Lordship is aware that interpretation of contracts, court documents, uh, judgments, and so on, is, in this country, regulated by the Supreme Court of Appeal case in Endumeni, which has been endorsed by the, by the, by the Constitutional Court in such cases as, the, as Manoim versus the competition. It, it's, it's Manoim. I've just forgotten the full citation below. But so that when you interpret the court order of Ms. Justice Mjali, you'd look into the text. That would be the starting point. It's going to tell your lordship nothing except that certain issues must be attended to, including appeals, before the regional conference, not the provincial conference, is undertaken. And then you would go to the background material. The background material to the order is going to be the papers that served before Ms. Justice Mjali. And this is why reference to paragraph 11 of the founding of David in that case is relevant to your lordship when he interprets that court order because if there's an interdict in that matter 
it only operates as against the branches that were implicated in the matter that served before Mr. Justice Mutai. Now, if the applicants wanted to implicate the entire region, they would have done so in the case that served before Mr. Justice Mutai. They didn't do so. Why? It has to be accepted that the reason they didn't do so is because the irregularities that they complained about in that case were found in the specific branches that were referred to in the founding of the but not in the entire region, which is what is sought to be done this evening. But your Lordship need only consider this if your Lordship finds that they make a case on urgency. If they don't, if they don't do that, your Lordship need not bother himself with the substantive issues in the application. May I confer with my colleague and seek instructions from our attendant? <clears throat> my Lord, I'm instructed that I nearly omitted the costs of the litigation. We, we submit that this is a matter that where the applicant should pay costs. And my Lord, we suggest that those costs should be costs of two counsel. In coming to that decision, we employ a Lordship to consider the importance of the matter, the, the importance of the matter, especially to, to both parties for that matter, but we say especially the respondents, the manner in which the matter has been brought to court, the failure to heed your Lordship's directive, <coughs> the fact that the respondents only got papers really when they were already in court. We say in, your ex in the exercise of your discretion, those issues should weigh heavily upon your Lordship. Uh, would that not translate rather into the type of costs ordered and the course issues? I understand you, you, you are motivating for the inclusion of costs for two counts. Indeed, indeed. Why, why did this matter deserve two counts? No, no answering plan is having prepared. Uh, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, if, if the primary issue is, is in fact one of the question of urgency, was it necessary for the respondents to have briefed to counsel? Well, well but, my Lord, we say it was necessary. Well, the issue primarily is not just the question of urgency. The applicants have not just, they have, no, of I course, didn't say a, that I said primarily, primarily the question of urgency is, is very Well, th th that's what we have argued. But the applicants did not just bring a case to court on, simply on the basis that is, it is urgent. In fact, they have not brought a case at all on the basis that it is urgent. But we say it was not being overly cautious for the respondents to, have, to engage the services of two counsel. Your Lordship should remember, what has happened here is that what we got is a directive and a message was communicated to your Lordship's registrar to inform your Lordship that papers have not, had not been received by the respondents. Now, the respondents don't know when is the matter going to be argued. They don't know exactly what case is going to be brought. Now, but the case involves the exclusion of persons who are entitled, as far as we, are, we submit and are concerned, who are entitled to participate and exercise their rights in terms of section 19, subsection 1 of the Constitution. Exclusion from an ongoing conference. We submit that this matter is no different to the matters such as Ramakatsa because even there, the right that was being implicated was a right such as the right that we're about today. And what the applicants really want is the exclusion of people who are some, somewhere and are entitled to participate in conference. They are saying that constitutional right must not be exercised by those people. We say, my Lord, it was not at all in, uh, being over cautious of the respondents to engage the services of two counsel. But we do accept that this is an issue that falls within the ambit of your Lordship's discretion. But certainly, the, the chaotic manner that the matter has been brought is one that would really, we submit, um, uh, inform your Lordship's discretion in, in the adjudication of the question of costs. My Lord, those are our submissions. Thank you, Thank you my Lord. <laughs> Let me start from the back of where my question ended. Specifically on the issue of children to be My next question says, why interdict, if there are only nine branches that are elected in the region, and why interdict the whole region? 
this is what is problematic about it, about this this argument. Right? Someone says, let certain branches, or rather, delegates that are appointed out of a region must participate must participate anyway in the regional conference because there are only a few branches that have been irregular. Then the question is, on what basis, if out of the very same region, there are irregular structure? then on what basis are, part, are some of the delegates participating in the regional conference? If the very same structure itself as the region is irregular or has some irregularities or alleged irregularities within, within it, then why? Why shouldn't the whole structure or the region participate? Because what participates on the provincial conference is the region, not the branches. Something that is yet to be determined in the main application. And... My Lord, there was, there was an argument. Unfortunately, I'm going to start from the back to the front. There was an argument that came from my learned friend who, where he says, when is the provincial conference? Now, the question is, do I understand my learned friend to be meaning that the regional, I mean, the provincial conference that is yet to sit now, or rather, is it denying the existence of the of the original, I mean, of the conference that is going to sit now? I understand that there are no answering papers filed, but can my learned friend say that because because there is no allegation of the of the existence of the conference, or rather, when is the conference sitting? Is my learned friend saying by countenancing that argument, is he saying that there is no conference? And I said, people, and I and I said, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I understand. I understand that was, it was made in proposition to that. But all I'm saying is that it's a matter, and I and I submitted earlier on. It's a matter on, of an iota that indeed the, the the provincial conference is today. It is sitting. I understand. It, it is a very technical argument from the respondent to say we do not know when the conference is. Or simply, if that was the case, they could have simply filed um, a, a two-page affidavit to say, like even now, to say no, there's no conference. There's nothing to interdict goes on to argue all the points, all the legal points, but it cannot come from the mouth of, of the respondent to say, we do not know when the conference is. He goes further to say in his argument, we do not allege the existence of that of, of the conference because we simply do not know. Not, we do know. We understand that the, the papers are faulty that I've conceded earlier on, and the papers were drafted in a haste. But is it a matter that can be ignored? Is there, a, is there an issue that is there, is there a matter that it can, it can be ignored that there is no conference because it does not appear on the paper? Certainly not, my lord. And, and, and I submit that this is unfortunately one of those matters where the court has to consider the truth over lies or the truth over over the schematic or rather the systematic drafting of uh, a beautifully drafting pa drafted papers. In this case, my lord, I, I, I submit that I understand that indeed there is no there is no. The, I mean, there is no particularity as far as the agency is concerned. But agency of this matter is glaring. And and this is a matter you know, that relates also to legality. So we are, I, I, I accept that as we sit, yes. there is a provincial conference pending. And you just start, maybe an hour or so, and in that respect, certainly it's urgent. Certainly. Again, mm -hmm. my, my problem with this application is that the urgency is self-created. I'm I, just using that there's an urgent yes. element to it, but I think that the, the, the glaring, to use uh, your expression, mm. the, the glaring impression that this court has that the urgency is not clear. Yes, I, I think earlier on I've debated this issue with his lordship as to, oh, yes. to, on the, on the, on the, the yes, on the, yes. And, and my lord, there, is, there was also an argument regarding submission of evidence from the bar. My lord, I submit that is incorrect, that is entirely incorrect. The reference that I've made, the reference that I've made to in the papers is in the main application. So it cannot be said that I'm submitting evidence from the bar and that's entirely unacceptable. There is nothing from the bar which I've submitted other than referring to the initial application, which in the affidavit, the applicant, the applicant is making it known to the court that in my entire, I'm going to be brief in the affidavit, I think that appears on the initial paragraphs of the papers, that much reliance is going to be made, that's on paragraph 4 of the final affidavit, much reliance is going to be made on the initial papers. And and I believe, my Lord, this is, this is an urgent application. I do not believe that his lordship should have been embezzled with a lot of facts that are already glaring on the main papers. 
only ours was to interdict, was to come forth and interdict the very same process which, which emanates from the previous application. All right, so those are the developments live for you outside of, oh, inside the Eastern Cape High Court. You've heard three voices there. It was the voice of Judge Justin Lang, who's presiding over the matter. Um, for the applicants is Advocate Dumisani Scorti, and the defense lawyer you heard uh, speak to us there was Advocate uh, Apla Bodlani.